Hello and welcome to the Smart Entrepreneurship Decoded, a show where we try to go beyond the superficial and speak to our guests to try to find that one insight, that one tip, something that we can try practically in our own lives to get to become a better version of ourselves. Today, I have a very special guest, more a friend than a guest, and he's all the way from Kolkata. I could speak for hours about him. Often, when you watch a movie on entrepreneurship or read an article, there are certain stereotypes, like there are for everything, anything else. In entrepreneurship, often it is about a young man who, apart from pursuing his education, is deeply passionate about an idea, creates a business out of it, sells it after lots of adversity for a whole lot of money while he's still very young, and goes on to higher and higher and higher material wealth. That's the stereotype. One half of it is true about our guest today. He is a tech entrepreneur who from the age of 19 started working on an idea and at the age of 22 had set up his business and had a very successful exit. But that's where it ended, the stereotype. After that, he came back to his hometown, Kolkata, and set up Kolkata Ventures, which has helped more than 4,000 entrepreneurs till today. There is a little more difference about him compared to other lives that uh, you see in entrepreneurship. After pe people become very, very, very wealthy, they try to find God or they suddenly discover God. But our guest today has always valued the mental side over the material side, has always valued the spiritual side more than the socially accepted successful side. And that's why he's special. I could tell you he's a multi-time TED speaker, speaks at all the top institutes, has been a TV host. I could tell you so many other things about him, but it's better we hear from him in person. Please join me in welcoming Avella Roy. Welcome, Avella. Thank you very much, uh, Nelanji, for a very wonderful intro. Very grateful. Well, you've accomplished so much in such a short uh, period of time. Uh, most of the people for what you have done, you know, they would be around the age of 60, but you seem to be a very wise person in a young man's body. <laughs> Is this how you were from the start? I mean, you, you, anybody who reads your bio knows that you're born into a family of freedom fighters, a very illustrious uh, family. There is a family business. You could have been a politician. You could have chosen to relax and run your family business. Calcutta is not the most happening place for driven, passionate people at the age of 19 for entrepreneurship, for other things, yes. So what was it? Were you born this way or what were you trying to do? Well, I started meditating at the age of five, if that tells you something. Um, so yes, I was a little different always, uh, always kind of looked into things a little deeper than most people do. Uh, to me, death was something very, you know, unique. It's like, how come that I won't exist, but the tables and chairs and windows and doors would exist, right? There must be something between somebody who's alive, a conscious being and something that's dull matter. And I was uh, experimenting, exploring, reading, and, and that was my quest. And yeah, a five-year-old doesn't do that, but that was who I was. And I have not changed much. Uh, that's the secret that I still am today. So, you know, you, you tasted success early and I'm sure it was not easy. Uh, why the different path after that? Why not serial entrepreneurship? Why not the next bigger thing? Uh, why a different approach where you're helping other entrepreneurs and you seem to be trying to discover a spiritual side to yourself? Why the shift in path? So, I mean, I have I have lived through all my dreams, to be honest. Uh, I mean, first business at the age of 19, 22, I sold it. Then thereafter, eight businesses, three exits. So I've lived through building my own thing and doing my own thing. And if I don't do anything for the rest of my life, it's okay. I'm good. But uh, 
what when i came to india and it was not my will that i came to india it was deaths in my family that forced me to kind of come back and take care of things uh i what i noticed was that the support i had received in the us uh the kind of mentorship kind of uh, the support system from the chicago community that i had received is not there here it is available for those who come from business families their parents yeah. help them their uncles help them but not uh for a common person who has a dream but doesn't know how to do it and it started from a, being a judge at a business plan competition i saw these kids had potential but they have no clue what they should be doing they ask you for 10 crores in funding with the powerpoint and as like it's not their fault let me help them out and it started with casual helping but then it was like a a waiting list of 45 people you know uh, after i did one event and i was like this is something that i have to somehow curb and put in a standardized form and that's why kolkata ventures was born to kind of give it a little shape rather than me doing it alone bringing in my friends from the us from hong kong from uh, india and then creating this kind of a platform where entrepreneurs help entrepreneurs because as you rightly said in calcutta it was uh, uh, a lot of people who have been consultants who have been uh, highly paid uh, uh, employees who are talking about startups having read books but never built one right and i saw that there was that gap here and here are entrepreneurs who could help entrepreneurs because one who has struggled through the process can actually understand somebody else's struggle and help them and more importantly why i do this is when i was figuring things out as a teenager my mentors that helped me uh, when i wanted to they told them what can i do in return for you because they have everything you know yeah. uh, uh, they said give it forward give it to the next generation right we don't need anything but make sure that this legacy continues what we have given you should continue to the next generation and that's what i continue to do is out of gratitude for my uh, mentors i give it forward to future generations so they don't have to struggle the way that i had to or or they had to so they can succeed faster you know and fail less you touched upon two pet peeves of mine one on the mentoring and one on funding and i've seen your videos on youtube you're hugely popular uh, because of not only the content of the videos because they're short they're succinct and they hit the point and you don't mince words uh, right that, that's a style i relate to let's take up the first one in one of your videos you spoke about don't get cheated by mentors now you <laughs> have been blessed to have very good mentors right what do you mean by don't get cheated by mentors so i'll tell you uh, the kind of mentors i have had uh, at that time the ceo of motorola uh, the mm-hmm. ceo of uh, uh, nokia this was before iphone came out so they were the the best phone makers uh, i stop had for moment. stop for a moment how did you get these people um they were on the board of my college they okay. were uh, patrons of my trustees yeah. of my college Go so ahead. through my professors i asked them through them contacts through their contacts got to the trustees and uh, when they saw that there is something to be proud of as a university these guys have come up with the innovation uh, which was basically apple watch before apple watch it was a necklace kind of like a smart necklace uh, they were like hey we should support this guy at least you know help him out connect him uh, fund him etc so getting that access was very very powerful and i saw even 5 minutes with a very you know uh, experienced ceo is so much that you learn in those 5 minutes no bullshit i mean i had the same experience talking to you when we met i think in himachal pradesh that you know i think we spoke for 15 minutes over a dinner conversation i got so much out of that so that's the re- real stuff like when you get the real insights versus uh, there are so many out there today that are the copycats of tony robbins and simon sinek they watched that one ted talk that they'll keep repeating over and over again and when i hear them i do exactly which ted talk they're referring to or which book they're repeating or what they have memorized uh, literally it's the it's the word for word and that's that takes you somewhere it gives you a little motivation but you and i both know motivation doesn't go too far right uh, insights do how tos do step by step processes do and i think that's uh, what a mentor does it holds your hand and kind of gives you a, a path and you figure out your path but at least you have some uh, idea of these are the standards and these are the things to look out for these are the things not to do there are things to do i might choose to do the things not to do but at least i know and there's a huge difference between 5 minutes with a person of experience and 5 minutes with book knowledge 
I agree. You know, I myself am very vocal about fake investors, fake, uh, you know, midlife burnt executives walking around like mentors, taking equity for free, collecting portfolios. So I, I relate to that. Talk to me about now you often find the word passion used so much for entrepreneurship. Does everybody have to have, I mean, is entrepreneurship the kind of a socially accepted almost compulsion for the youth today? <laughs> do people have to follow their passion to get a profession? I mean, does everybody have to do that? I mean, is passion overrated? I, I think the word is psychophysical nature. Uh, a lot of times people ask, what is the kind of startup to do which investors will invest now? Like, Why does it matter? What matters is how you can add value with your skills and qualities and solve a problem of a market. And that's what is important, to be honest. And if you do that, if you're aligned with your psychophysical nature, as it's said in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, you know, so everybody has their strength and everybody has a weakness. If you can figure out what your strength is, then you will be able to be at your best and solve the problem at your best. And when you see you're doing something better than others, it gives you a boost. It gives you confidence. Right. And that progress is what passion is, really, where you feel that jolt of energy like wow i'm actually good at it let me do more of it oh i can't sleep because this gives me um recognition this gives me uh, a fulfillment this gives me a self of uh, uh you know satisfaction recognition whatever that one might be that i can do something that better than others right and i can solve problems as an outcome and byproduct of that could be money so that whole process is passion now, a lot of people don't know what they're passionate about. They think they like to watch movies. So movies is their passion. But that's not necessarily true. You know, if they were asked to make a movie, they probably wouldn't be able to do it. So passion is about finding out what you do best, better than others. You're gifted to do that and really becoming the best at it. And as you do it, you have a lot of fun. It's not work anymore. And that, uh, that seems to be high energy. You can't sleep. And that's passion. And that's not necessarily it's there at the beginning. But as you do, as you figure out, as you go through the journey of self-discovery, you figure out, oh, my God, I didn't know. Like for me, being an engineering student, I never knew what marketing was. I heard the term marketing. People do MBA in marketing, but I didn't know what it was. But after doing multiple businesses on every business, I would do product development. I would also do marketing and branding and brand positioning. But what I realized was I was really good at understanding psychology and how to um, explain my product in such a way to a certain audience that they understand whether it's investors whether there's a customer with the co-founders and later on i understood this is what marketing is literally educating others about why something that you're selling is valuable and i did, although i don't have a degree in marketing or anything like that i realized that is my passion and eventually i realized it so that's what i do i don't hire a cmo i'm always uh, in my companies i am the one marketing uh, because that's something I have. But it took me a long time to figure that out through so the journey of self-discovery. So, yes, I didn't start with it. I started with product development technology, which is kind of boring in one sense. You know, reading legalese, hundreds of pages, reading patents. Uh, for me as a kid, I was filing for my own patent, you know, and going through all that legalese was hard. But it was not fun. It was not passion. But it was something that would lead to my passion. And that's what propelled me to do it. So a couple of points there, you know, uh, you hear this often kind of debate, should entrepreneurs uh, seek uh, perfection or should entrepreneurs just go with what is just about right or just a little better than what is available for their products themselves, etc. Is it better to seek progression, like compounding interest, get, getting better and better at something step by step rather than seek perfection? What's your view on that? There's no such thing as perfection, uh, okay. you know, because otherwise we wouldn't have so many. Every phone is better than the previous uh, version of the phone, right? So it, it's eternal. You'll always try to make more perfect, more perfect. So better to start with where you are into incremental progress, compounding progress as you go along. Uh, some people, especially as engineers, uh, tend to uh, seek perfection. And in the process, they get lost at analysis paralysis. And I've seen companies that are stuck for three years, four years, just building features forever, never touching the market, never caring what the market wants. And before they can even launch, companies have built their product, got exits and got it out, and they're still building out. I'm, I'm truly telling you, like, true story. 
you know so that's what perfection leads you to yeah i've seen a few entrepreneurs spend years and years perfecting a product because they are more like phd scientists than business people and you know ultimately the proof is only if people use it and there is acceptability of the product and unfortunately people uh, equate themselves with steve jobs you know when steve jobs was coming with the phone in iphone he yeah he was a perfectionist but he is steve jobs right he's one in a trillion i mean not everybody has to be steve jobs and you know given who we are we can either sit there and just figure out or or actually keep making progress and earn as you as you go along let's move to the second pet peeve of mine which you also mentioned this obsession with funding but i saw a video of yours that says how to set up a business without cash now if you showed that video to a young person in college they would basically say you're a lunatic heist how is that possible give us a few examples what and i know you're right i know half the people who come to us seek for seeking funding actually don't need cash they need advice what how do you break that barrier or or is it too tough a thing for us to try so when i made that video it was still a new thing but if you look at today's teenagers they're more mature than today's uh, 20s you know people in their 20s teenagers are actually figuring out this zero money thing where they are starting with drop shipping they're starting out with some way of making money using internet laptop and their phone right and once they have a little money then they go into crypto or they go into tr- stock trading or build something you know it company website company something so so that's smart that's what actually is the zero money uh, uh, idea but people in the 20s i have seen being like oh it's only for the rich people you know unless you have uh, an investor you can never start your startup and i'm like okay so if you don't get invested do you start no like then you're not an entrepreneur go get a job that's the job mentality right otherwise people uh, jugar is basically you know you figure out a way to make it happen regardless of somebody helps you supports you or not money has many names money can be in the form of favors money can be in the form of uh, uh, barter money can be in the form of credit money can be in the form of gifts you know money has many names if you don't have cash if you don't have a rich dad figure out some other ways of of getting what you need and and that's most people don't have that and that's why most people are actually not meant to be entrepreneurs and uh, uh, it's good that they try to be entrepreneur because it opens up their mind but eventually they go get jobs because that's the best place for them because otherwise they would burnt because the journey of entrepreneurship you, you and I both know how hard it can be how burning it can be uh, and how much mental strength it requires to go through all the struggles one doesn't have to unless one's crazy you burned me tonight when you gave the example of the movie business and passion you <laughs> don't <laughs> <laughs> know with me right away <laughs> but uh, well i saw another video of yours actually i i follow you a lot you a lot you know your videos on the bhagavad gita lessons from there on the mental side of things is very enlightening even if you know it it is often refreshing to see it again and somebody else propound it i don't know of any other young person trying to talk about the mental side of things which we know is a lot you spoke a little bit while earlier about uh, you don't have a degree in marketing but we don't have a degree in parenting in loving in most of the things we do in life there is no degree for that where do you go you have not even gone to school for that but you figure out you learn some get better some are good at it some are not some get better over time what is the mental side on on that i want you to focus on a particular area there are a lot of books written about the early morning club 5 am club call it what you like mm-hmm. but the common thread i take out of it is a lot of success successful people not all some of them are not morning people a lot of successful people tend to have a certain routine whenever they wake up to set themselves up for the day a lot like sports stars go through a pre 3 4 hours mental conditioning or thinking of how they set themselves up for the day do you have a mental routine or a morning routine and if yes if you're okay would you share that with us just for our viewers how does it work sure. um first thing is i i get up and i uh, offer my respects to god i offer my gratitude for another day it's another opportunity to do something wonderful um i write down after that three things that i want to accomplish today three 
key things that I want to accomplish that is aligned with my long-term goal. Um, then I do the washroom stuff, you know, get cleaned, come out, and then do meditation. I meditate for two hours. And after two hours of meditation, I start checking my emails and going through those three things uh, that I wrote down on my to-do list. And then everything else is kind of like after uh, uh, 10 a.m. or so, it's kind of my assistant takes over and he has his whole schedule. And one after another, we go through uh, calls and whatnot, meetings and whatnot. So uh, the point I noted in, uh, most important in that is you write down the three things you want to achieve, right? It's okay. not that you think about it. You write it down. Yeah. Write it down. Do you go back and uh, recheck in the night or what's that process? No, as I'm going through the day, I'm checking off from the list. This is done. This is done. Unless it's done, I have this, you know, I have to get it done. That sense of kind of unsettling feeling. And that's important because that keeps me from wasting time. Okay. Because that unsettling feeling is like, oh, I cannot waste time. I cannot get distracted. I have to finish those three things. Okay. No, that's that's good to know. Do you have any advice for people who sleep very late compulsively? I mean, they can't help it. They are just not morning people. Should they just have another routine, not call the morning routine, but something similar? In the in the Vedic system, it is uh, given that the twenty four hours is divided into eight hours, eight hours, eight hour segments: sattvic, rajasic, tamasic, or goodness, passion, and ignorance. And all three are important. And if one wakes up not in the goodness period, he will wake up in the passionate period, where it's kind of a mismatch. Where, because you need that little time in the morning to kind of you know get ready, kind of slowly soothe into work, versus your bounced into work, right? That is a little uh, difficult. So uh, aligning with nature is always better for health, for mind, for everything. But if you're not able to do that, wherever you start, start your cycle from there on, you know, whether it's a meditation part or whatever, but slowly start, allow your body, your mind to soothe into your work, have a plan for it, what you want to accomplish rather than than being random, really know what you want to do today. How do you want to use the next uh, 20 hours of your day? And that way, if you plan it, at least you achieve what you achieve. Even if you're not able to wake up in the morning, at least plan out the day. You know, Start with a little bit of meditation, breathing exercises, so that you can psychophysically align yourself to, to do the best you can. Having said that, if one is compulsively waking, you know, uh, staying up late. I would suggest try it one day, even if you are up all night, just try to see working in the morning, what it feels like. I think that experience by itself is very rewarding. When you realize by 10 o'clock, you're done with half the day's work. When everybody else is getting to work, you're almost done with the day's work. It's a great fulfilling feeling. And I think even if one can experience that, one will understand the value of uh, our morning hours, and that would probably kind of try to achieve that. Okay. So, fine. You start in the morning. You've got a to-do list. You've done your meditation. You're set for the day. You run through a calendar. How do you keep yourself nourished in terms of knowledge? Now, everybody says they read, they do this, do that. What do you read? what do you read? Where do you find it? Because for young people, firstly, reading is not a habit that is very fashionable nowadays beyond the 140 characters. But most of them in the clutter of the in information we have don't know what to read, where to find it. What do you read? What does a person like you read to have this kind of knowledge and wisdom? So first of all, let me just say, I'm also one of those young people who doesn't like to read. So I hear uh, for me, audiobooks work much better than actual tangible books. And uh, my bathroom time is very sacred. So that's when I always spend 45 minutes. And I have a wireless speaker. I have Audible app. And I, I listen to uh, various books. But I alternate it. On one day, I will hear from Audible. Another day, I'll be hearing from uh, my guru about Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam. So spiritual uh, lessons one day. And another day, it would be more on the mechanics of life that kind of book. So uh, how do I get it? I, I generally get recommendations from people like yourself who are uh, successful, who have a history of being efficient, productive. I have a, a really great friend in Nepal. He keeps giving me the best possible book. Uh, he, he is the founder of uh, this company called Toodle, which is a copy of uh, Uber. 
So uh, he, he's one of those millionaires in Nepal who's come out of the startup boom. So, you know, I used to uh, advise the prime minister of Nepal. So there's quite a few success stories that have happened in Kathmandu. He's one of them. So, and he's a very wise man, Sikshit, his name is. And he gives me certain book recommendation I get from my mentor. I get from, uh, uh, from some of my CEO friends, but I get it from people who are really somebody I respect. And when they say it, read this, Avela, you would love it. I do because they know. And, and if they have benefited it, I can see in their business the difference it has made. And that's validation for me that it will work for me too. That's good to know. So that goes back to having a group of mentors you respect and who can provide you inputs of different kinds. Because every mentor doesn't necessarily have to guide your business. They could be Correct. guiding you. Correct. So that's a, that's a good point. I'm going to move to another topic, something that you made a video on as well. A lot of entrepreneurs... And I don't mean to demean tier two and tier three towns because there is a caste system of that in India's entrepreneurship world. Uh, I do believe they come up with better ideas and are more grounded. But they lack confidence. They lack the ability to communicate in a manner that the sophisticated world of you know the, the English speaking elite or the brown sides kind of seek because ultimately they have to deal with such people either for investment or growing the market or as a clients etc it's inevitable what is the advice to them how do they build their confidence how do they build that communication uh, effective communication that doesn't mean fancy words but just effectively deal with these people who are seemingly more sophisticated seemingly um, confidence comes from your grasp over your market understanding and uh, if there is any progress or success, no matter how small in your startup, uh, the fact that you've been able to make that happen brings in the confidence. So my suggestion would be actually get to know your market, get to know the problem and get to know validatedly that these people are willing to pay for your product or service. Because that uh, for me, when I uh, look through, I don't look at investors to guide me. I look at my market to guide me when the eye lights up and says, oh, really you can build that for me i would love to pay for something like that that inspires me and that motivates me so i suggest the same thing i have seen many times people who cannot speak english uh, and be like can i speak in hindi and they're super confident they're super articulated and they're and totally okay you know most people are fine with that as long as you can help me understand what you're doing and why you're valuable and why your your solution is better than 10000 other uh, solutions out there Right. So it's not a matter of language. It's a matter of uh, your depth of understanding. If you're confident on your product, others will have confidence on you. And so it's first important that you get convinced. You look at your competitor analysis. You look at all the patents. You get to know the market scenario and get to know that you have a chance. And when you're convinced, oh, my God, this is something I have. I've hit gold. That will come out in your speech, no matter what language you speak, no matter how bad a communicator you are. And that actually sells uh, to investors or co-founders or whatever, whoever you're trying to convert or uh, convince to, to help you. That's what sells. Super. Now, I watch a lot of your Bhagavad Gita videos as well. And you're very kind to send them to me on WhatsApp. Give me or give our viewers one favorite analogy or story of yours that would help an entrepreneur in their journey from the Bhagavad Gita, something that's dear to you, something that resonates with you. Sure. So uh, in chapter two, uh, Krishna says that uh, chapter two, text 62, I think, uh, just four verses where he talks about the eight step process of how a person gets attached to certain object, a material object. And once they get attached, then expectation arises. If the expectation is unmet, frustration arises. And frustration evolves into anger. When anger happens, one's memory is bewildered. When bewilderment of memory happens, you forget who you are. You say things and you do things you regret later on. And eventually, you, you end up hurting yourself and hurting others. Right. I find it absolutely beautifully dissected uh, uh, anger, you know, how anger starts and how it can destroy you. 
And now most CEOs, most entrepreneurs have an ego. Some know how to sugarcoat it and hide it. Some, know, some don't, uh, especially those who are young. And I have been uh, uh, that. I have been arrogant. I have been uh, that kind of a guy who would get a criticism and not be able to take it and write back immediately without thought and then regret the whole day. Oh, bad. I should have written that. That person is very useful, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, send five more emails apologizing and all of that. And I found myself doing that over and over again till I understood this Bhagavad Gita verse. And then I caught myself. Am I having expectations? Am I caught in attachment? Am I getting frustrated? This means I'm going to angry now. If I get angry, I lost control and I'm going to say and do stupid things. Avello, pause. Breathe. Walk around, drink some water, come back. And with the optimal mind, think, how should you respond? Should you really say that? Or should you say something a little bit more polished? And I tell you, Nalinji, 15 minutes of gap has saved me so much embarrassment. You know, of course, do I get angry? No doubt. I'm building something amazing. Somebody criticizes my product. I get absolutely mad. But then I give myself time. I breathe in, I breathe out. And with an optimal mind, I respond where they're not hurt. I'm not, you know, uh, uh, taking their crap either. But it is something that's a mature uh, kind of communication. And I think that's one thing, if I can explain from Bhagavad Gita. There's many things, of course, but that's one thing that I can say. Okay. If I may okay. share another one, uh, if I may, just one more thing I want to share, which is very, very useful, at least for me. Um, in Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna talks about the three modes. Like I said, the eight hour, eight hour, eight hour, Sattvic, Rajasik, Tamasik. Same thing with people. We all have this combination of Sattvic, Rajasik, Tamasik, goodness, passion, ignorance. But some people have more of one like one dominant out of the three and as a manager as a ceo if you can recognize what the person is has the dominant characteristic you know how to motivate them so for example people who are more on the sattvic side who have a balanced life or more on the academia side they are motivated by recognition by respect not so much by money uh, a person who's more the uh, rajasic they are, you know, with uh, more, more money, more achievement. If you make others, them look better than others, they feel motivated. Employee of the month or, you know, you got a bonus that nobody else could get, etc. And then the, the tamasic folks, you know, they just need sense gratification. That means give them something, booze, give them some, uh, some kind of way to just gratify their five senses and they'll be happy. So a uh, raffle ticket, go watch a movie, you know. So if you understand this, you know, who is what mode, then accordingly you can manage them, motivate them and give them what they want and what would get them to give their best to your company. Yeah. Very important points. Some of my takeaways from what you just said, and I, I put it slightly differently for people who get angry and uh, tend to speak uh, before the thing. I tell them to practice a one second gap between the brain and the tongue and their natural intelligence will temper the words, at least temper the words, but you gave a much better way. One of the things I've noticed, I don't know whether you've experienced it or not, is often some of these very passionate people who get angry at criticism, etc., or or some uh, feedback, often they're angry at themselves for not having thought about it, rather than somebody pointing it out. The, I guess the more intelligent ones would be angry at themselves. Yes. The less intelligent ones are upset about other people. Like, oh, how dare you not see how great a person I am? <laughs> that's, that's true. That's very true. So we, we are coming to the uh, end of this uh, chat, though I could go on chatting with you for hours. But tell me, you came back to India. And now, of course, you're also participating or running your very a very traditional family business. Mm -hmm. How has that experience been? I mean, do you feel like sometimes just going back? Oh, yeah. I mean, Kolkata Ventures is great, but the family business dealing uh, with manufacturing and laborers and unions and bribes and corrupt politicians. Oh, my God, it's horrible. I mean, it's really not a gentleman's uh, you job. Should not say, you should not say corrupt politician. You should just say politician. <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> maybe you're right. <laughs> uh, but but the point is, it's it's really not a gentleman's world uh, to do business in India in a physical, traditional kind of a way, where you really don't have any control as a CEO. You know, if you have a hundred employees, they have their union and they have their power to tell you what to do. Uh, they will bring in a political party and they will have power. There's the police, but they don't do anything. Uh, in, in what I realized, I didn't know this actually, but what I've realized is there's the, the judicial and the police and all this system created by our, our uh, constitution. And there's a parallel uh, system of gundas and politicians and all these people. And tends, these guys tend to be more effective than the police if you need anything done. So you pay taxes to the government and you pay uh, yearly or monthly uh, taxes to these local thugs mm -hmm. just to make sure they don't uh, put a puncture in your uh, truck's tire or whatever else, right? And it's like, how do you do business? How do you make profit? I mean, you have to have insane profit margins to be able to pay taxes to two parties and survive. And and God forbid, if you hurt somebody's ego, you're screwed. So yeah, um, welcome, welcome to Kolkata from California. <laughs> <laughs> So, absolutely, last question. You know, you, you're mature, you're wise, you really uh, give some great insights and advice to people. Do you have a fun time? Is there a fun side to you? Uh, <laughs> uh, not in the traditional way that, that others would think. Okay. Um, on, on a daily basis, I, I do watch certain detective shows or whatever. End of the day, I'll have my little, I throw a party to myself, me, my mind, and some show on Netflix or whatever. Uh, on, a, on a, when it's not Corona and pandemic, we have spiritual retreats where okay. for almost 10 days, uh, I go to Vrindavan or, or places of pilgrimage and intensely kind of deep dive into- You remember I sent you photographs from Vrindavan when I was there. <laughs> A year and a half ago. <laughs> oh, a year and a half ago. Yeah, I guess same time I went also. But it's like it's that. So really spiritually immersing myself into into happiness that most people don't understand. But to me, that is a, a, a happiness that cannot be the flavor of it cannot be compared to anything of this world. And that's my way of kind of recharging my batteries and refreshing my mind and finding inspiration to do what I do every day. Fantastic. Avello, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you very, very much. Have Thank a great you. evening. Hare Krishna to you. And Hare Krishna. talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care.